This week I visited Yale Law School and saw my friend Mike Widener, curator of its rare books and manuscripts. Mike is in charge of an extraordinary collection that includes law books from across the world, many of them hundreds of years old. I was looking through his shelves when something unusual caught my attention. Since 2010, the Rare Books Library has been the repository for all of the bobbleheads and bobblehead prototypes created by the legal humor magazine, The Green Bag. They work like this. Justice Blackman wears a baseball cap with the colors of his favorite team, the Minnesota Twins. Justice Thomas wears a wristwatch, a symbol of his commitment to timelessness and judicial interpretation. In 1994, Justice Souter wrote the opinion for the court in a copyright case involving the hip-hop group Two Live Crew, hence the gold chain. Justice Ginsburg stands atop the parade ground of the Virginia Military Institute. Justice Scalia stands next to a wolf because he once described a particular approach to the separation of powers doctrine as a wolf in sheep's clothing, though I suspect many liberals think including the wolf with a bobblehead is appropriate for other reasons. Seeing all of these uniquely crafted bobbleheads made me think about the legal culture that produced them. What do the bobbleheads say about how Americans view law? I asked Mike Widener. It's human at its very core, you know, and um, so that's why I think, you know, the bobbleheads kind of embody that to a certain extent, you know, the kind of the, the human element in law, you know. And I think that's what makes, for me, makes the books come alive also, you know. They're, I mean, especially when there's evidence that people actually use these books. They belong to somebody. The books belong to somebody, to a flesh and blood human being with views, perspectives, a unique biography, and a body one can caricature. What Mike said made me think about how other legal cultures view the same question. The first country that came to mind was Germany. I was in the library with a young German lawyer who was in town for a conference at the German American Lawyers Association, and as it happened, that day was the anniversary of the 1990 German reunification. Over the years, I've spent a fair amount of time in the country. My wife and I like to visit its peaceful, charming small towns. We love riding its fast intercity trains, where you can drink tea and try to decipher a German newspaper. And we love its Christmas markets with crepes filled with Nutella and mulled wine and don't get me started. But mostly what brings me there is academic lecturing and teaching. I especially teach about American law to German students and other professionals. And that's given me a particular perspective on how Germans understand their law differently from Americans. And in Germany, there are no judicial bobbleheads. In the German ideal, law is a formalistic science. It's an exercise of pure reason using precise intellectual procedures to interpret areas of the legislative code where there's some uncertainty about its application. The German commitment to this approach comes in part out of its experience under National Socialism during World War II. The democratic state the Germans created after the war was based on an approach to legality in which the personality of the judge is meant to be definitively out of the equation. The law is meant to be literally disembodied, and Germans know very little about individual judicial personalities. Even the very best German law students would be hard-pressed to name more than four of the 16 members of their highest court, even though the court is one of the most important and respected institutions in the country. This difference is reflected in the number of books and magazine articles written about judges' lives. A quick search in an American library catalog reveals 264 individual books about American judges. Searching for the keywords law and biography yields over 2,000 results. In the United States, many of the most intimate details about the lives of our judges are known. But in Germany, this is almost never the case. The exceptions are mostly for men like former Justice Paul Kirchhoff, who are actively involved in politics. And so, not surprisingly, a search for German judicial biographies reveals a very different numerical outcome. You'll get a similar result if you search for the terms judge and biography in the catalog of the German National Library. 
or try searching for the terms constitutional judge biography. And so the bobbleheads tell us something serious about the differences between two countries which are bound so closely together but view law in such profoundly different ways. But this reverie brought me back to America and to all those bobbleheads on the shelf. So I'll give the man who takes care of them some last words. So Mike, which is your favorite bobblehead? My favorite? I, I kind of like the Brandeis one because it's different from the others. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I like, the, I like trains. Uh, they're all kind of nice. I like uh, Justice O'Connor's because of the, the calf, you know, showing that she grew up on a ranch. Um, I think those are probably my my favorites of the bobbleheads uh, that have not yet been produced. What what what's the future bobblehead? Do you think what what needs to be produced next? Oh, I don't know. They uh, actually they uh, uh, Ross Davies at the Green Bank has actually has a this planned out. He uh, takes the sitting justices. I believe it's in order of seniority, or he tries to because he doesn't want to play favorites, obviously, you know, and so he's been careful about that. And then the others, he's going back to historical justices. Uh, I'm not sure of the plan, but he has a plan. So uh, I'll, I'll just wait for him to uh, crank them out. If, if uh, a bobblehead were to be made of Mike Widener, the librarian <laughs> of the Rare Books Library at Yale. <laughs> no, I don't think so, please. <laughs> no, no. I think that's a bad idea. <laughs>